Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we've got a This Year in Perfume. It's been a while since I've done one of these. Had a lot of stuff go on in the meantime. We had the Liz Moore's interview with Papillon. Russian Adam came on for the second time. Uh, and I've been doing some more individual reviews, talking about individual perfumes, which I'm going to try and do more of as the channel continues to grow. <clears throat> I found that people like, you know, searching for an individual fragrance, either that's their scent of the day or whatever it is, and, and they see a video pop up. And so I like doing these videos where I can talk about a lot of fragrances, but I also like doing the videos where I just kind of focus on one. Uh, and I like doing the live streams. I like doing everything. I mean, this is a hobby for me that I absolutely love and enjoy. Uh, but these This Year in Perfumes focus on a particular year. I'm going off of Parfumo, all right? So again, if you see something on Base Notes or Fragrantica that's different, understand I always go off of Parfumo.net. Um, so 2009 we're at, and every year, excuse me, that this continues to go on, I keep thinking, man, this is going to be the year I only have one or two fragrances in my collection, and it's not. I've got both sides of the desk filled here from 2009. Uh, but we are going to do Scent of the Day first, and um, it's this little Creed, a gray cap, uh, do you know what this is? There's no name on it. Um, and, uh, there is no This Year in Perfume from the year 1780. I'm just kidding. This did not come out in the year 1780. Do not believe Creed and their complete bullshit. Excuse my French. Um, it, there's no way in hell that Royal English Leather came out in 1780. Uh, I, would, I, I would dare Creed to sue me in you know, prove differently in court that this came out in 1780. Um, if you've read the Ghost Perfumer, which is right here, um, Gabe Oppenheim talks about how Olivia Creed basically turned the House of Creed from a men's haberdashery tailor uh, into a perfume uh, seller in the 60s and 70s. And so anytime you see a creed that says, oh, this was made for King Henry of England in 1780, don't listen to that. It's complete and utter hogwash. And uh, that being said, okay, this is, this is what happens when you watch my channel. You get stuff like this. Uh, I still love this fragrance. Royal English Leather is one of these leather fragrances that, you know, lately, I'll tell you this, lately, whenever I crave a Creed, it's not a Ventus that I crave. It's not, um, you know, a lot of these other popular ones. It's not Millicene Imperial. It's this. Uh, but you know what? I am a leather lover, and so leather is an easy sell for me. And what's interesting about, what's so interesting about this Creed for me is, you know, Creed has this DNA, right? that makes it very attainable and accessible to wear anytime. It's gonna be 99 degrees today. We're getting a bit of a break from the heat wave. It's only gonna be 99 today. Um, and this works perfectly for a leather that you wanna wear you know, in the summer, in the spring when it's not uh, cold. Most leather fragrances people like to wear in the cool weather. You know, If you're gonna wear something like Bellamy or something like that, um, you know, Pure Distance M, Roja's Fetish, those kind of leathers. Most people wear those in the cooler weather. This works beautifully in the heat because it has that Creed Fresh sparkle. And they've what they've done is it's a very simple composition, actually. It's only bergamot, mandarin orange, amber, leather, and sandalwood. And you've got that Creed Smooth Sandalwood. Um, and these EDTs, they're known as the gray caps because, obviously, they have gray caps. Now, the cap itself looks like it came from, I don't know where it came from, you know, the cheapest factory in China you could ever imagine, but um, it, uh, you know, it's it, it weighs probably less than nothing. Um, but they were called the great caps because they were all eau de toilette concentrations. Creed doesn't make any eau de toilettes anymore. They're all eau de parfum, okay? And so these were priced a little bit cheaper. These were This was probably one of the best bang for your buck Creed scents you could buy. Um, and it has this freshness from the orange. And usually orange can be hit or miss. There's this tangerine, mandarin orange uh, that mixes with the leather. And that creamy sandalwood, that, you know, uh, Creed ambra uh, ambergris, right? Uh, that am salty ambroxan 
ambergris, whatever you want to call it, that Creed signature DNA is, it's here and it's fresh, but you get that leather that I love. Uh, it almost gives you like a coffee vibe for the first hour because of the way that the notes mix, the leather uh, mixes with the freshness. It almost gives this cafe-like vibe, but there's no coffee note in here, obviously, but it's just beautiful for a man. I mean, anyone can wear this, but this does lean very uh, masculine to my nose, leathery and spicy and stuff like that. But uh, Royal English Leather, not from the year 1780. Don't listen to Creed's marketing BS. But if you can remove yourself from that and still like the fragrance, whenever I crave a Creed lately, I crave this. It's just too bad it's so expensive and impossible to find nowadays. But if you stumble across a bottle and you can find it for... 300 or less, it's probably a good deal. Um, especially if you like that Creed fresh DNA that you can wear any time of the year. All right, let's hop into the fragrances from 2009. First, we're going to do Ombre Nuit. All right, now this is only a decant. I don't have a bottle of Ombre Nuit by Dior, but I did an early impression video of Ombre Nuit on my channel. You can check that out. You can go to the playlist under Dior or early impressions and find it. Uh, and this is basically uh, Francois Demachy early in his Dior career, came out in 2009 obviously, uh, with this bergamot, grapefruit, pink pepper, Turkish rose, there's a beautiful Turkish rose in here, with this lovely amber slash ambergris, that's the big debate. Is it amber? Is it ambergris? And go watch my initial impression if you want to get a little bit more detailed breakdown, but uh, Ambre Nui, uh, there's a beautiful Gaillac wood patchouli cedar as well in the base. It's spicy, it's woody, it's, um, you know, this is back when the Dior Privés were really seen as Privés. The stuff they put out in the last couple years is just absolute garbage. Eden Rock and all that crap, you can just ignore all that. But the early ones, like uh, Ombre Nuit, Eau Noir, which Francis Kirkjohn brought back, you know, those were good. Those were worth it. Uh, and then there's an early impression coming on this fragrance, which is Zerzhoff's Osol, which somebody in the comments recently said that it reminds them a little bit of Fleur du Mal, which is a very hard to find discontinued fragrance. So if you can't find Fleur du Mal, apparently Osol is very close to that. I haven't smelled it yet though, but I will be doing a early impression uh, on my channel very soon. This is a 2 ml sample, so that'll give me enough for, you know, a full day wear and wear it before bed one day and stuff like that. Um, I just don't know why these brands use these shitty decants. Like, look at this. Zerzhoff is a niche brand. Why is there not a cap with a real, you know, uh, an atomizer, um, a a sample uh, display that matches the um, luxuriness of the brand, right? If you check out an Amouage sample, you'll notice they have caps. They, you know, it's it's just... All of the brands that are luxury houses that charge more than $200 a bottle, even Roja uses these on his little 2 ml samples, it, they should not be using these, you know, it's, it, that should be reserved for stuff like, um, you know, Versace or stuff like that, you know, Ferragamo, the designer houses should use these, the niche houses should, you know, pay the little bit extra money, get the better samples in my opinion. And then... One that I'm very excited to talk more about on my channel. I need to wear it more. But this is Guerlain's Abbey Rouge X-Ray. So they actually did an X-Ray of Abbey Rouge in 2009. It is now discontinued and very expensive. Um, this is basically Abbey Rouge's bergamot, lime, orange, lemon. That citrusy opening that you, you know... If you're someone who says, I hate citrus fragrances, I would say check out Abbey Rouge EDT because it highlights the beauty of the citrus notes so well with that Guerlainade, the vanilla, uh, the leather in the base. Actually, come to think of it, it has very similar contrasts to um, the, my scent of the day, Royal English Leather. This also has that citrusiness with that leather. Abbey Rouge fo you know, follows a similar pattern, or I should say, this follows a similar pattern to Abbey Rouge, because I'm sure Abbey Rouge in the uh, mid-60s came out before Royal English Leather. But um, Guerlain's Abbey Rouge Extra is one I'm very excited to get into. It's got that spiciness, that patchouli, the leather, the vanilla. 
Oh, I can't wait to talk more about this on my channel. Um, wish I could find a full bottle of this and not get, you know, bent over the coals, but um, I will. At least 10 mLs is more than enough for me to wear it multiple times and talk about it and stuff like that. All right, let's start with a couple fragrances in my collection from 2009 that I'm not a big fan of. The first one is a Rasasi, and it's called Al Wisam Day. Pour on. Um, and so Rasasi is a Middle Eastern house. They're known as a quote unquote clone brand, if you will. And, you know, their favorite fragrance for me um, is this by far, hands down. They're, the best fragrance they've ever done is La Yucca Wam. It's a Tuscan leather clone, if you will. Uh, Al Wasam Day is supposed to be a clone of Silver Mountain Water. Look at the bottle. You know, it has that white um, Silver Mountain Water. Look, you can see the stuff. I mean, there's some weird stuff floating in there. Um, I don't know what's floating in there. That looks very strange. Uh, but I did a fresh spray. And this just doesn't do it for me anymore. Um, I thought I would give it a try. I was kind of testing Rosasi's and it's almost cheaper to just buy a bottle than try to buy decants of this somewhere. So I just bought a bottle for, I don't know, 28 bucks or whatever it was. And it almost smells like a mixture of, um, it almost smells like a mixture of Silver Mountain Water and CK1 in the opening. It's got that lavender, um... Oak moss. There's even an oud note listed, but I don't get any oud. Um, it's 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 a strange beast. I wouldn't recommend anyone would even waste twenty five bucks on it, to be honest with you. And then the one that's even more expensive, I wish I wouldn't have wasted money on. I wish I just would have spent the money on this on a bigger bottle of New York Intense. Is Patchouli Intense by the House of Nikolai, uh, and Patchouli Intense. Uh, used to be called Patchouli Om. I don't know if you know that, but before they changed the name, um, it used to be called Patchouli Om. And they changed the name, and I'll tell you what, I am not a fan of this. I need to make myself wear it and talk about it on the channel, but it just has this spicy, heavy geranium. Like, one of the heaviest geranium fragrances you'll ever smell. It should have been called Geranium Intense, to be honest with you. It's not a it's not that it's a bad fragrance. It's just it's not my favorite. It's a very scratchy patchouli with big dose of geranium. I'll um I'll wear it and talk about it more on the channel, but honestly, the best thing she's ever done is New York Intense. I mean, if you're a fan of fragrances like um Bois de Portugal or stuff like that, New York Intense is an absolute uh, knockout. If you like Chanel Pour Monsieur, New York Intense is amazing. Um okay, now let's go to uh, some designers here. So next on the list, we've got a Carolina Herrera fragrance from 2009, of course. And this is called CH Men. Now, this is a vintage bottle, okay? Uh, the new bottles don't have this little thing, this little thing right here, which I love to play with. It um, has it just kind of like stapled down here on the, on the corner. Uh, and so I, I've never done a comparison. This is the only one I know. Thank you, Anuj, for finding this for me, by the way, my friend. Um, it's kind of this sweet, leathery thing. And as I've made clear multiple times on my channel, leathers are a very easy sell for me. Uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm loving Royal English leather today. Um, and so this is, um, I think, uh, before this particular bottle... I want to say is before Carolina Herrera was purchased by the House of Puige, but I'm not 100% sure of that. There's no Puige markings on here. Oh, yes, there is. Yes, there is. I'm sorry. Take that back. Uh, so Carolina Herrera has been owned by the House of Puige for a while, you know, at, at least since 2009. And But this fragrance, uh, I think, is a is a sweet fragrance that I can stand, if you will, even though... There is, it almost feels like they dropped like a pure sugar cube in here with the leather. There's little other touches going on, like there's this greenness that comes in. Almost like this green grass note in the background, but not freshly mowed grass. Almost like an artist interpretation of what grass would smell like. So you don't get that 
you know, you know when you bag up fresh grass, it almost makes your nose like crinkle. You don't get that. You get this designer grass smell with some violet touches, some purple violet, um, saffron, and some spiciness from like nutmeg and um, vetiver. And the leather, I mean, look at the packaging. This is actually leather right here embossed with the Carolina Herrera logo. Beautiful packaging. I love this bottle and package. Uh, I love this little concept here, and you can still see the juice in the back. Um, and the leather almost gives off this suede-like vibe. I actually have these uh, suede shoes, and, you know, and, and when you touch them, it's got that soft suede feel, you know? You get that in the dry down of, of this. The opening hour or two is beautiful, even though it's sweet. And all of the things I mentioned, the vetiver, the nutmeg, the grass note, the leather, the suede, the saffron. Imagine if you took all that and just dropped a sugar cube in there. Just dropped it in like you dropped a sugar cube in a, in a cup of tea or something. That's the vibe that this fragrance gives you with the, uh, with the leather. So if you want to start exploring leather fragrances, but you don't want to jump straight to the stuff that I love so much, like Bellamy and stuff like that, you want kind of a bridge, this is a great starter leather because it's uh, easier on the nose, it still has that leather note, but it has lots of designer sweetness to it. So this is kind of a um, guilty pleasure for me, if you will. Okay, next let's go to the house of Salvatore Ferragamo. And this is a discontinued fragrance now, which is shocking. This used to be everywhere. This used to be ultra cheap. Jeremy Fragrance recommended this, and I actually agree with him. I think this is a good designer scent. Uh, it came out in 2009, and it's called um, F by Ferragamo Porom Black. F Black. Uh, and this is a little, what is this? A 30 ml bottle that I have. And, and um, you get this uh, lavender... Uh, apple and pepper note that Olivier Poles was playing with. Uh, for me, it reminds me kind of, not in smell, but in construction in the way that uh, Olivier Poles worked on. Um, there's a little bit of Midnight in Paris in here, and there's a little bit of Dior Homme in here, just a touch. Strangely enough, I get little touches of Dior Homme. I don't know where that's coming from. Maybe the lavender. I think there's lavender in uh, Dior Homme as well. There's no iris here, uh, but there is coriander seeds, labdanum, and tonka. And for a mass appealing designer, I mean, I've smelled much worse. This is 2009. I think this is right before the designers really started going to the dark side, um, which is an interesting quip for F Black. But um, I don't pay hundreds of dollars for this, but if you find a bottle on the cheap or a partial or something, and you're looking for a good designer, um, this is one that, you know, you might consider. You might consider. Uh, I think these used to be all over Ross and TJ Maxx and stuff like that in, a, in America. You know, the big time discount outlet stores. And then, um, one of the uh, new additions to my collection, which I plan on wearing in spring and summer. I haven't had a chance to really give it a full wear. It's a woody, earthy scent from Jean-Claude Elena. It's called Terre de Hermes Parfum. Now, uh, the original Terre de Hermes, uh, with the loads of, you know, dirty orange and ISOE super and stuff like that is, um, an EDT. And what's interesting about that is he jumped straight to the Parfum. There was no EDP. There's no Terre de Hermes Eau de Parfum. It's just EDT and then straight to the Parfum. And uh, this has this note of obviously that grapefruit that you get in Terre de Hermes with that cedar wood, Isoe Super. But they've added uh, a little bit of like benzoin, this resinous benzoin in the base and a shiso note. And um, this is much heavier, much less, you know... Um, for the people that don't like the fact that Terre de Hermes EDT kind of comes and goes, it kind of plays this uh, peekaboo game. If you want to smell your fragrance all the time, go for the Parfum. I, I, um, even though this is, some would say, oh, this is too heavy to wear in, you know, spring and summer, I would still, I'm still planning on rocking that in spring and summer. And then one of the weirdest fragrances in my collection, very hard to pin down, 
And um, the story with this is also very strange, is a fragrance from the House of Bond number nine. Uh, and it's called Bond number nine. It's either called Signature, depending on which algorithm you look at, uh, Signature or just Bond number nine, Bond number nine. Uh, and this is actually a pure parfum. So this is, if you look at the bottom, you'll see right there, it says parfum. So this is a hundred mil parfum version of a fragrance from 2009. Uh, Laurent Le Guernac is the uh, perfumer. I have no clue what else Laurent has done. Um, actually there have been some other things that, uh, Laurent has done. Um, Bitter Peach by Tom Ford, Lady Million by Paco Rabanne, Solo by the House of uh, Loewe, Stash by Sarah Jessica Parker. I, I would love to check that out one day. I've never smelled that. New York Oud from the same house, which I think is a better fragrance, but, uh, sticking with, um, Signature, what makes this so strange is it has this Oud Rose Accord, which is done to death, okay? I'll agree with ev everyone that says... Whenever you hear rose oud, if you just kind of sigh and go, ugh, and slump your shoulders, another rose oud, yes. I mean, the rose oud abounds. Uh, there's a million rose oud combos. But what makes this one unique, and the reason I bought a bottle, is that it has this very interesting musk. Uh, and Russian Adam sent me real deer musk. He sent me uh, synthetic deer musk. He sent me vintage deer musk. I mean, I've smelled all of the real molecules. And I don't know, you know, obviously I don't think Bond number no. 9 is using real deer musk. I don't think even legally they can. But the musk has this billowy, cloudy um feel to it. You know, and when you mix that billowy like, you know, um almost like smoke just uh traveling in or, or clouds kind of rolling in, it has that billowy fluffiness to the musk that is very hard to do with synthetic musk. And, um, you know, the Rose Oud, to me, almost plays a background. Uh, I don't even know if I want to say background, because that's not true. All the notes kind of interchange in this. But the musk just kind of takes hold of the fragrance. And it gives it that billowy texture, right? That, that billowy, musky texture. It's very hard to do. So I'm not saying this is a good fragrance. I'm just saying it's an intriguing fragrance. Uh, I'm intrigued by it. And um, there's also a little bit of uh, sweetness from Tonka in here. Um, and, it, I mean, it's a beast. If you, It's one of those fragrances that it just says... Uh, this is what I am, and it just lasts that way. There's very little, um, there's very little, uh, transformation in this fragrance from when you spray to hour 10. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna last. But, uh, that is Bond number 9 by Bond number 9, or Bond number 9 signature, depending on which algorithm you're, you're searching for. Okay, now we're gonna go to a Bertrand Duchafour, actually back-to-back -back Bertrand Duchafours, the magician, the master, uh, the master of incense. And this is called Mon Numero 10. Now, there's actually 10 of these. The 10th one, I think, is the most popular one. This is the vintage um, bottle from La Tizan before they sold to Puig and they changed the bottles. And it's basically this spicy, smoky thing that Bertrand Duchafour um, created with lots of cinnamon, lots of frankincense. Of course, there's going to be frankincense. It's a Bertrand Duchafour. And this peppery cedar-like note that, um, you know, people give... One of the complaints I've heard about jubilation is, oh, it's it's 90% uh, synthetic or whatever they say. I don't know what they say about it. I don't care if it's 100% synthetic. I love jubilation 25. It's one of my favorite fragrances of all time. And this also gives off this you know, the cedar might be isoe super, I, I don't know what they're using, um, but it gives off this peppery, woody, um, smoky from the frankincense. It's a Bertrand du Chiffre, so you're almost like, is there a Divana note in here? You know, you're constantly looking for that Divana note, 
And I mean, it's he's just a master at, at creating stuff. Even when it's under the radar, no one hypes up Mon Numero 10. I don't think I've ever heard anyone even talk about this, but what a great fragrance this is. Um, and then in another uh, fragrance I feel almost exactly the same way about is Al Oud by the same house. And this is, again, a vintage bottle. You can find these 100 mil bottles floating around for relatively cheap on the internet still. I guess the fact that this has this cumin, challenging opening is what it is. It has this cumin uh, spicy opening that um, when you spray it, you know, if you're looking for the oud, because it's called al oud, it doesn't come right away. It comes later on in the dry down. But what you get in the opening is this cumin, spicy with cardamom, pink pepper, and this date accord, this accord of dates, which is very Middle Eastern. And, um, you know, there's leather in the dry down, but there's this beautiful iris note that comes out later. And, uh, and then myrrh and cedar and tonka, sandalwood, patchouli, and there's even a little touch of civet. So it's a dirty fragrance because you get cumin in the top, oud in the heart, civet in the dry down. So it's constantly kind of doing things. But this is, again, very underrated. Uh, it's got frankincense, of course, because it's a Bertrand Duchafort. Frankincense, saffron, rose, oud. There's a lot going on, but he's hidden the rose-oud combo. It's not just a rose-oud, right? He's, he's masked it under the cumin, dates, cardamom, and then the civet. So you're kind of constantly wondering, what are you smelling? Am I smelling the cumin? Am I smelling the oud? Am I smelling the civet? Am I smelling the you know, uh, saffron, the frankincense, it's, it's this constantly ever-changing fragrance. And, um, you know, for a hundred bucks, I mean, quite frankly, it's, you're not going to find much of a better composition for a hundred dollars. Uh, if you can get these older bottles, do it just because I've never smelled the new stuff. Uh, actually I, I take it back. It's discontinued. Um, that's probably why there's so much bottles floating around all of a sudden is they're probably just pumping out the last of the stock and that's that. So, um, and then we're going to go to a Frederick Mall called Geranium Pour Monsieur. Now, this fragrance set off a entire chain of events because the I believe it was the base of this ended up turning into a Portrait of a Lady, which Portrait of a Lady ended up becoming a huge hit and ended up turning into The Night, basically. Uh, the Night is like Portrait of a Lady, but with Oud added instead of the big patchouli. And um, Geranium Pour Monsieur has this uh, mint and peppermint thing in the top that uh, I'm not 100% in love with yet. I know Rich Mitch loves this fragrance. To be honest, uh, I like Rose and Queer better. Uh, if I'm going to wear something in the summer so far, Rose and Queer has really kind of uh, done it for me. But the dry down does give you this clove, cinnamon, ambroxan, frankincense, and musky thing. Um... It's just great. It's a fresh green, you know, you have to like mint though. It does, some people say this comes off as too toothpaste-y in the opening, and I understand what they're saying. Um, it's a like, it's not a love for me yet. This is a love though. I don't care what anyone says. Uh, I love this fragrance. This is Nasomato's Black Afghano. I absolutely love Black Afghano. It's my favorite cannabis fragrance. If you, if you're, if you are, um, tempted at all to buy Guerlain's new Abbey Rouge Le Instinct because it has a cannabis note, buy this instead. Buy Black Afghano. I'm telling you, you will be um, you will be thankful you did so because I love this fragrance. Uh, it's got this obviously green cannabis opening that just blends into this resinous incense. Ooh, dark. There's a coffee note in here. There's a tobacco note in here. Um, it's just this bad boy, um, you know, you're, uh, a rebel without a cause driving down an open highway in your leather jacket, um, going to do whatever you're going to do, uh, whatever rebels without a cause do. It's just this, you know, uh, you know, very individualistic, very, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to break the law, but, um, you know, you may break the law just by speeding a little bit. You're not going to go do something crazy because even I wouldn't wear this to work. 
Um, but if you did, I mean, the cannabis note is not like people are going to think you're, you just did a J in, in the, in, in hot box your car or something. No, they're not going to think that, but it is there. Um, but this fragrance is all about all the other stuff to me. It's about the resins, the incense, the oud. I love this fragrance. I think it's absolutely, uh, amazing. It used to be a Fragcom darling back in the day. No one talks about Black Afghano anymore. I know Mark uh, from Robes 08 used to love this stuff. I mean, I love the the dark juice. I love the um, I love the tenacity of this fragrance. I mean, it just you know it really competes with some of the big guns coming up here later. Uh, so next, we're gonna go back to Guerlain, a fragrance we talked about yesterday in my Thierry Vassar Perfumers portfolio video. This is Guerlain. Ohm. Now it's currently just called Guerlain Ohm Eau de Parfum. They used to call it Guerlain Ohm Eau de Parfum Intense, which is doesn't, they don't call it intense anymore. They dropped the intense. And uh, this is this fresh woody lime with almost like this mojito accord. So you get some peppermint, lime, mojito with this rum, you know, whenever you make a mojito, you get this, um, you get this alcoholic rum note. But this is another one where even though there's alcohol in it, just like even though there's cannabis and black afghano, both of these, I mean, this is more, this is much more work appropriate. Uh, I would probably save this one for the weekends, but it's not like people are going to think you're a drunk or it's not like people are going to think you're a stoner wearing these. You know, they're very well blended and uh, there's some floral touches in here, but basically in the base, there's vetiver. This is a vetiver composition at heart is what it is. And so if you want a vetiver, almost how, you know how Timbuktu, I would say, is a vetiver fragrance at heart, but it has so much more going on with that uh, mango note in the top and all the other stuff, all the different moving parts of Timbuktu, that green mango in the top. This is kind of um, constructed in a similar way in that the heart of this fragrance, the chassis this fragrance is built on is vetiver. But there's a lot of other things going on with the mojito and there's a little bit of patchouli and cedar and it was the first uh, masculine line release that Thierry Vasser did for Guerlain because he took over in-house perfumer one year before this came out. This is the old presentation. Don't pay big money for the vintage with Guerlain. Just get whatever the modern formulation is. They keep their stuff um, current and up to date from my understanding. But I've never smelled the new, whatever the new one is in the low midi out bottle, I've never smelled the new one. So maybe if you can get the uh, Listerine bottle, the one that looks tall, uh, Listerine looking bottle. But, um, you know, if it's a big price difference, I'd say just get the modern. You know, don't don't pay big money for vintage Guerlain. It almost is never worth it because they change their packaging more than any brand I've ever seen. Uh, okay. Next, let's talk about another old Fragcom darling that uh, kind of fell out. No one talks about this anymore. Joy Amin talks about it on his channel sometimes, but uh, this is one. I love this. I love this brand, and I hate what L'Oreal did to it. They butchered this. Uh, don't buy the new L'Oreal bottles, okay? I'm telling you right now. Try to find one of the old bottles that says Thierry Mugler on the bottom. The one that just says Mugler, stay away from uh, this is pure malt, and I'm so glad I have basically a full bottle. You know, I've only worn this a couple times, but I love this stuff. Oh, it's so good in the winter. It is this whiskey um, with coffee. So there's this whiskey coffee uh, combination, but the amazing part about this to me is there's this earthy peatiness. There's this, so even though it has that amen patchouli, you know, sweetness going on. They used malt CO2 and they used peat. And that peat, almost like a peat moss, if you will. Uh, it gives off this earthy vibe. And the earthy vibe blends with the uh, whiskey. And it just is such an, one of the best liquor fragrances money can buy. You don't have to spend big money on, you know, um, you don't have to spend big money on Roja's Creation E, although I love that fragrance. You don't have to spend big money on some of the other big whiskey um, fragrances. 
you know, there's some niche uh, whiskey fragrances that uh, you could spend big money on. Bod Bodicea, the Victorious, or all these other brands that, you know, you're going to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on. You don't have to do that. Just go for pure malt and get the one that says Thierry Mugler down below. And you'll have one of the best liquor fragrances for, uh, you know, marketed for men. Most, most alcoholic fragrances I've found are leaning masculine. But there are some that go feminine, for example, that have like a martini note or champagne note. But lots of whiskey, you know, if you see a fragrance that has whiskey in it, lots of times it'll be masculine targeted. But um, just a beautiful composition that just felt, I think when L'Oreal kind of took over and um, kind of butchered this line. I mean, they have just straight up butchered the Thierry Mugler name and line. You know, I think just people just kind of threw up their hands and went, eh, I mean, there's so many fragrances nowadays. There's thousands of releases a year. Uh, it's just insane. You know, it's impossible to keep up with, like I've said. And you don't want to keep up with it. You want to just buy what you love, wear what you love, and that's that. And, um, you know, this, I just feel like people just kind of threw up their arms and went, well, they butchered it. Let's move on to something else. And that's what they did. So they forgot about this. But if you can find these older bottles, again, it's it's worth it. It's worth hunting these down. I love this line. I love Amen. I love, uh, I even love Pure Havan, which is sweet tobacco. Normally, I don't like sweet. But when it's done properly, I'm a, I'm a big fan. And this is fantastic. This, you know, Amen DNA with that malty, peaty, um, you know, earthiness. It's just amazing. Just an amazing whiskey fragrance. And again, another one that even though it's whiskey... You could wear that to work. I mean, no one's going to think you're a drunk or anything. Uh, it's very elegantly done. Okay. I'm going to show you the box of this one. I normally don't have the box to show, but these amouages I kept in the box. So we're going to go back to back. We're going to do the men's and the women's version. So 2009, this is Rhonda Hamami's creation, which she's the, this is the only fragrance of her that I own or know of even. Uh, this is called Epic Man. And if you're going to make one fragrance, um, what better fragrance to make than Epic Man? It's just absolutely stunning. This is supposed to be a homage to the um, Silk Road uh, from China all the way to the Middle East back in the day. And there's the little bottle that you've seen sitting on my shelf many a times. Uh, with the magnetic cap. I wish I had a pre-magnetic cap version, but you know what? This is perfectly fine to me. I don't need it. I'm happy with this. This has this, oh, I love this stuff so much. It's just, it just instantly when I smell it, I'm reminded of days in the winter. You know, I'm reminded of November, December, January days, because that's usually when I wear this. But even when I've worn it and it's warm, lots of people, I get a lot of attention with this. Just because it's so different and it's so, it has this um, spicy, woody, resinous thing going on. There's so much going on. Um, there is that uh, Omani frankincense here. But it starts out <clears throat> somewhat aromatic with that green myrtle and mace. And there's touches of cumin, but it, I wouldn't call the cumin as heavy as in like Al Oud. Or anything but there is touches of cumin in epic man and there's that middle eastern saffron with spicy geranium and you can smell the geranium in here uh, with resinous myrrh with leather oud patchouli castorium sandalwood cedarwood and musk so what's amazing about this though is that it's almost like every ingredient has its turn. You know what I mean? It does It does blend together to give you this, um, you know, what hits you when you first spray and smell. It smells like you're smelling just like a blob, like, a, like, a, like, a, like you're smelling everything at once. But then all the ingredients kind of get their turn. And I love the dry down of this. I mean, it lasts all day, 10 hours. This is a 10 hour plus fragrance. And this isn't even the Mag this isn't even the original non-magnetic cap, and this lasts all day. Now, I've heard the newest one that says Epic down here instead of... Uh, see, mine doesn't even say Epic on the sides. But the newest one that says Epic down here, 
I've heard has been butchered. That's that's the rumor. I've never smelled it my on my on my own, but that's what they say that it has lost a big step compared to these older bottles. So even the older non-magnetic cap bottles I hear are better than the or the current mag or the um, older magnetic cap bottles like I have are better than the modern stuff where they've now written um, you know uh, epic down below. So. Uh, Epic Man, put that on the list if you've never smelled it. It's absolutely stunning. One of my favorite Amouage creations. And then we have Epic Woman. So here's the box for Epic Woman. Beautiful presentation. This is a uh, vintage bottle or an older bottle. Not so old that it's a uh, non-magnetic cap, but, you know, Old enough where it's a current, it's a previous version. You can tell it only says Oman Perfumery LLC right here, not Sabco Group or whatever the new one says. Um, and this is how the bottle sits. And I'm so glad I got a hundred mils of this because this was actually purchased at the, I love these, I just love the way Amouage does a presentation. I mean, you know, it's just, per, it's just clean, but also so gorgeous and elegant. And um, the magnetic cap is just so um, satisfying. It's, uh, this is a Cecile Zerokian. She had help though. Danielle Mordial and Angeline Leporini also worked on this creation, but usually it's Cecile Zerokian that gets the, the love. Uh, and this has this also cumin in the opening with pink pepper and cinnamon. Um, which I don't think there's any cinnamon in Epic Manor. If there is, it's kind of toned down. The cinnamon is turned up in Epic Woman. And you get this beautiful damask rose. So you get this rose geranium combo. Again, the geranium is in Epic Man. This adds this definite damask rose note with tea. And the tea in here is so relaxing. It's so just, I mean, you know, you get the resinous um, frankincense, if you will, Amouage, Omani frankincense, and Oud combo, but the additions of the um, tea, the cumin is amped up in the opening, and um, the smooth iris, I mean, you know, beautiful iris note. It's just... I mean, I, 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 I almost want to say in, in my heart that I think this is the better fragrance, but I love Epic Man so much for me personally, it's hard to say that. But if I'm being objective, this is probably the better release, honestly. Uh, but I think I just love Epic Man so much because of the memories attached to it that I just couldn't, I can't say I, I personally like it more. Although if I'm putting on my objective hat, I think this is the better fragrance, Epic Woman. If you're a guy, do not overlook these women Amouage releases. I'm currently hunting Lyric Woman. It's not an easy find, the vintage Lyric Woman, but uh, I'm looking. Okay, now we're gonna go to a Francois Demachy creation from Dior, 2009, of course. Uh, and this is a flanker of one of Dior's greatest masculines ever released. It's called Fahrenheit Absolute. Now. Fahrenheit Absolute, there's kind of the notes on the back. Uh, essence of Myrrh, Encense, which is incense, Oud. Um, and uh, this has this oriental spicy take on, on um, Fahrenheit. And so you keep a little bit of that violet. I think he kept the violet leaf... Um, in small doses, but amped up the violet, that purple violet smell. You know, this is, I get a very purple vibe in the opening here. With these aromatic notes, I, I detect maybe some sage or something like that in the opening with a huge dose of myrrh. And, you know, Francois de Machy, for all of the grief that I give him uh, about, you know, doing his best work on flankers, which I think is true, you know, um, he uses myrrh in a way that just is stunning to me. That's why I like uh, Eau Sauvage Parfum from 2012. Same thing. 
Uh, he used this Murr note in Fahrenheit Absolute that's just stunning. Uh, and, of course, there's the leather that you get in Fahrenheit and, and Frankincense. Um, and he, he added this Oud note, which was all the craze back then, right? 2009. And um, then in 2012, he followed it up with this Murr in Eau Sauvage Parfum, which is, again, another flanker. But the way that he uses Murr in these two fragrances is just stunning. I mean... You know, we give him a hard time, and rightly so. He deserves part of the, the, the hard time we give him. But he also deserves his flowers when he does something right. And um, Fahrenheit Absolute is just, you know, probably the best flanker of all of the Fahrenheit's. It's definitely better than the Le Parfum, or whatever they call it now, Parfum. Um, and it's, it's, it's probably one of my favorite Demashi creations, to be honest with you. I love this stuff. It's dark. Uh, Robes 08 called this the devil's juice, and um, I don't know if I would agree with that. I, I mean, I think of maybe Black Afghano as a little more than as the devil's juice. Maybe if the devil wanted to wear a designer, yeah, for sure. Fahrenheit Absolute. It does have that darkness to it, that mist, that mysteriousness to it, that resinous undertone with with touches of Fahrenheit in the top. Beautiful flanker. But it's going for silly money right now. I'm just glad I got this 100 ml tester. Um, it's an eau de toilette intense is what they call it. But uh, amazing fragrance. And then we're going to go back to Creed. And this is listed as 2009 on the um, Parfumo website. But actually there's a story behind it. So it's Royal Mayfair. Uh, but really in 2009 what came out is a fragrance called Windsor. Creed's Windsor, and um, Windsor and Royal Mayfair share the same notes, and Parfumo bunches them together as one fragrance, but there are slight differences. They're definitely the same fragrance, but I think this was kind of reformulated and then reissued, um, and then reissued uh, under Royal Mayfair, and this is basically this floral fresh fragrance. But it's so posh. For you guys that don't know, um, you know, the uh, uh, Duke of Windsor, I think, is who they initially claimed that this was modeled after. Or who they claimed, I think it was, he was actually the one who wore this. Um, who knows the truth to Creed stories. But um, Royal Mayfair is... Um, you know, Mayfair as a street is a very high-end, maybe the most high-end shopping area in London, Mayfair. And that's what it's um, uh, named after because they opened Creed's first boutique in uh, Mayfair in London. So this was to almost commemorate that. They released this fragrance. This is still available, apparently. Although there's rumors flying that it might be discontinued soon. Uh, and this is the original that came out in 2009. So this came out like 2013 or something. I can't remember 14 exactly when Royal Mayfair came out. Uh, but it was years after Windsor. Windsor was like a limited release, right? And so Windsor and Royal Mayfair have this gin, lime, and pine um, mixture in the opening. And a heart of rose and tuberose. And a base of eucalyptus, orange, and cedar, okay? Okay. And there's this, um, there's, you know, there's a lot of criticism about Creed that they just release designer-like fragrances in niche bottles and charge $500. And some of that, there's some truth to it. But Windsor is one of those releases that, uh, you know, Creed kind of really proved that they are a niche house because this fragrance, uh, I didn't like it first. In fact, I almost gave it away. I almost gave it away. Like, just take it. Someone else take it. I can't wear this anymore. Because it's challenged me. You know, that eucalyptus um, is is powerful. It, it really did challenge me. And I thought, God, I can't, you know, I can't wear this. It When I wear it, I'm kind of like, ah, oh, what, what is going on? It was very hard for me to wrap my head around it. And then all of a sudden, something clicked one day. After years of having it, you know, wearing it and putting it away and going back to it and that kind of stuff. And, you know, if you guys have listened to my story, my journey as how I basically got here, Creed was one of the biggest influences in my journey early on because I made the mistake. And granted, I was younger. 
I wasn't as well versed on fragrances and I made the mistake of thinking higher dollar tag must mean better fragrance, which is not always true. Do not fall into that same trap. So I just bought whatever was expensive back then. I would just buy Creed's, Amouage, you know, now I'm glad I have all this stuff, but um, I, I would, I, I would um, thumb my nose at something like this back in the day or something like this. I would, I would, I would uh, thumb my nose at it, you know, or even um, Terre de Hermes Parfum. I, I, I was only wearing Creed back then, right? Or Amouage or something like that, which is completely wrong. But because of that, I got a chance to test this a lot. Look at the dent. that This is my dent that I put in this bottle. I mean, I wore this a lot over the years and um, it's challenging. It, it really is. The main difference... And, and by the way, the rose note in here is absolutely stunning. It's one of my, um, it's one of my favorite rose fragrances of all time. All right. I would say this is one of my favorite rose fragrances of all time, especially on the niche side. The way that they did this rose feels um, very, they, they made it very masculine somehow, but also so posh. You know, look at the um, front. I mentioned suede earlier. This is like a suede. I don't, know, I don't know if you can tell the texture of it, but it's almost like feeling a piece of suede. Smooth, right? Um, you know, leather has that harsh feel to it. Uh, suede is just, you know, it's just, it's just smooth, like a smooth operator. You know, that's what this is. This reminds me of a, you know, of a very posh upscale uh, well-to-do, uh, guy, has his life together, pulls up in a vintage Jaguar, has style, class, you know, something like that. I said Jaguar because it's an English car, and Royal Mayfair is to commemorate the, the English, but, uh, I mean, it could, it could be anything. Uh, and, you know, he just has that natural class about him. That, that's what this is. It doesn't follow trends, just has that natural class. And I heard people say, oh, you know, the, um, the, uh, eucalyptus or whatever, it feels, it, it smells cheap, this, that, or whatever. I thought the same thing, but if you continue to wear it, you'll realize the beauty of Royal Mayfair. So again, they bunch these two together. They're basically the same fragrance. Uh, I will do a comparison video one day because there are differences. This one, uh, has this, it almost has this, um, in simplistic terms, the differences, I would say, between the two, just high level, are that Creed's Windsor versus Royal Mayfair, Windsor has this alcoholic-like vibe. So if you smell Windsor, it smells like it's been barrel-aged, all right? Like they took the, they took this and they barrel-aged it. Uh, and, you know, when they barrel-aged it, it came out... Um, it came out, uh, you know, keeping the um, facets of the barrel that it was aged in, you know, like there are little alcoholic aged woody facets that it took from the cast that it, that it was, uh, that it was aged in. And this, and, and Windsor has that and um, Royal Mayfair doesn't. It doesn't have that aged, boozy, alcoholic vibe to it, even though there's gin in here. It focuses more on the the lime, the pine, um, and so it doesn't have that boozy aged facet, but they're both amazing. I mean, I can, now this is a vintage. I've never smelled the new um, 50 or 100 mil. This is 120 mil, but um, so I guess if you can find a vintage at a good price, maybe grab it. Grab these old four ounce creeds are, the four ounce or the 75 ml, or, uh, or the 75 ml are the only ways I bought my creeds. I won't buy the new ones anymore. I actually did. I bought one. Here it is. I bought one. It's uh, Himalaya, and I do think this is a shadow of its former self. This is a good fragrance. I like this fragrance, but it doesn't do what the vintage does for me. It smells, uh, and I and I had a four ounce. I had a big four ounce of Himalaya, so I finished the four ounce and then bought this. So you know, to everyone who's like, oh, you know, um. To everyone who is, you know, going to say, well, you just don't know what you're talking about. I, I trust me. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I went through an entire four ounce bottle and this is definitely reformulated. It's not as, um, 
the sandalwood in it, which is still nice, but the sandalwood in the original was stunning, beautiful. It gave me this church, it gave me this church-like vibe. I mean, it was almost like holy, like awe, you're awe-inspired. This just has this, okay, it's nice. Um, and as soon as I bought this and I smelled this, I said, never again, never buying another one of the 100 mil bottles. Um, so anyways, that's my story. Um, and then the final two, let's do this before the hour mark. The first one is a asterisk and it's Feminite Dubois by Serge Lutons. And Feminita Dubois tech has an asterisk by it because Shiseido released Feminita Dubois in the 90s under the brand Shiseido. But um, Serge Luton's purchased the formula from Shiseido and released it under the Serge Luton's brand in 2009. Okay, so this is a tester bottle that I found. I love these, these 50 ml Serge Luton's bottles. They're perfect. You know, it's a shame... I won't buy the new stuff, just out of revolt, you know. I want them to go back to these. I want them to go back to distributing in the United States, period. They don't even distribute their fragrances anymore. Um, this is a Pierre Bourdon, Christopher Sheldrake creation with Serge Luton's working as a creative director, basically. And this has this honeyed beeswax plum peach uh, with a beautiful cedar base. And back then in the 90s, creating a woody fragrance for women was unheard of. They were saying, what are you talking about? You want to create a woody? So you want to create a woody fragrance for men? And they said, no, we want to create a woody fragrance for women. And everyone was like, what? You want to do what? And, you know, what's funny is now, if you listen to some of these interviews with perfumers, um, many, many perfumers, if you ask them, what perfume do you wish you could have made, you know, They'll say Feminita Dubois. I mean, this was revolutionary at the time. Now, this is uh, much more transparent. It's not as thick. It's not as heavy as the Serge, as the um, Shiseido version. But it's still good. And um, I still enjoy it. And I'm still glad that I have lots of juice to play with and wear and talk to you guys about. And then finally, probably my favorite release from 2009. I wish I had a second bottle of this, but prices are insane. Um, especially for 50 ml. This is Filenagil. Serge Luton's Filenagil. Uh, Christopher Sheldrake's masterpiece, in my opinion. Oh, God. This, you know, there's actually a niche fragrance that I smelled recently. And I will do a uh, early impression video on it very soon. But it's called, um, it is called Spell 125. And Spell 125 reminds me a lot of Feeling Aguil. I think this has more ambergris in it. And there's some other, you know, differences going on. Um, but this, this has Siberian pine and black hemlock. This has stone pine needles and frankincense and bay leaf. Uh, and what so amazes me, just high level talk about uh, Filan Aguil, is that Filan Aguil has this uh, ability to capture, you know, in my mind when I smell this, when I wear this, I can imagine myself standing in a forest, right, amongst a bunch of pine trees. Um, and not only did he capture the feel of the pine, the resinous feel of like the sap of the trees, you know, if you ever put your hand in a tree and it gets that sappy stickiness on it and it stays, even if you try to wipe it off, the sap stays on. Um, and the frankincense gives it this, you know, fiery, smoky aspect to the composition. But he also somehow managed to capture the sky, in my view. You're looking up, standing in the forest, and there's this fresh, clear, blue sky day. I don't know how he did it, but, you know, this is one of the most transportive, photorealistic fragrances. I mean, I just uh, immediately just, when I smell this, even from the atomizer, I mean, I just transfer to a forest somewhere. Like, I'm just, you know, um, teleported. And Filan Aguil is one of the most... Um, 
all of a sudden prices on eBay and in the secondary market just went insane. You know, so I'm just glad to have the little bit that I have. Uh, I wish I had a backup bottle, but we'll just have to enjoy this. And one day I will do a full review of this once I wear the bottle more. So that's 2009. It's one hour, almost one hour on the on the nose. Thank you everyone for watching. If you have um, fragrances from 2009 that are not mentioned, obviously I can't own everything. But uh, if there are fragrances from 2009 that you want to give a shout out to, leave it in the comments. Uh, I love seeing your faces in the comments. Uh, a like and a subscription and all that good stuff obviously helps the algorithm. It helps like-minded people find me, but uh, you don't have to leave a like and a subscription if you don't want to, but it is very much appreciated when you do, because I know you don't have to. Uh, and uh, thanks for the support, everyone, and thanks for watching, and uh, let me know what some of your favorite 2009 memories were, and which are your favorite fragrances. So cheers, guys, and I'll see you again tomorrow with another video. Bye now.